When I was a new travel nurse, I lost four grand in the onboarding and moving process alone that I did not have at the time. This was pre-paycheck and I want for all new travel nurses and for everyone who is moving for a job to never experience the same mistakes that I experienced. Whether you are an RRNA who is moving for clinical sites, you are a CRNA who is relocating and then dipping their toes into the locum anesthesia world, or you're a travel nurse, or you're a new grad who's relocating for a job, all of these tips are going to save you money and save you a massive hassle. So in this episode, we're talking about how to save money and how to move and relocate effectively, particularly as a travel nurse. <laughs> okay, so how did you lose $4,000? Like, where does that number come from? What exactly happened there? I've had a fair amount of time to reflect now. It's been three years since COVID of 2020 when I first started travel nursing. And the main place I lost money was in housing. So I'll tell the story, then I'll tell you what not to do. So when I took my first travel nursing assignment in California, I was coming from the East Coast. So Baltimore to LA is a pretty long flight, drive, however you want to get from point A to point B, you're going to have some transportation relocation costs, right? One thing to consider as a new travel nurse is that you don't get your first paycheck until about two weeks after you start working. So all of that stuff is going to be upfront on you for your housing, your transportation, your flights. That comes out of your pocket pre-paycheck. What it ended up happening was I went out to California with somebody who I didn't really know very well. And that's kind of an aside of like, I would honestly recommend getting your own place when you're relocating and you're travel nursing, at least until you get to kind of know somebody better. And I think also just dealing with the stressors of living in a new city, working maybe a really intense contract, I would really just kind of recommend moving somewhere alone. If Unless it's possible. someone you know really well, like, oh, you've been roommates before, right. they're your nursing bestie, and y'all are going to be travel nurses together. Like if you went to nursing school together, if you've known this person, you worked with them forever, I think that's a little bit of a separate situation, and I would recommend that. But if it's somebody you don't know very well, don't throw into the mix of also starting a new travel contract, living with somebody brand new for the first time. That would be kind of just like... <laughs> just an aside. An aside okay, so, tip. so what about the money? So you get there, and you're with this person you barely know. What happens? What had happened was, is we had booked this Airbnb, and when you book an Airbnb, you have to file a complaint within 24 hours of the booking window that you checked in. So what had happened was they got there before to California before I did. And I didn't check in until about a week after we had already booked this Airbnb. When we get there, the Airbnb is like unlivable. There's no running water. The parking is about half a mile at the bottom of this mountain with no street lights to walk up the top. And there's like mountain lines in the area. Like <laughs> we're like lugging our suitcases up this like gravel road and like LA County somewhere and then also there's like 14 cats and then like the sink is under construction it's not really livable <laughs> but we had booked it for over a month so I ended up losing a couple thousand dollars on this Airbnb because it wasn't really livable we filed a complaint with Airbnb they didn't were never able to really do anything about it and then I yeah I ended up eating a fair amount of money on that first like relocation to move to a new spot so nobody read the reviews on this Airbnb first, or do you think they were just fake reviews? I think there was a cup. I think it was a combination, like a few fake reviews, and then it was like a fairly new listing. It just like was not as described whatsoever, which actually like leads me into <laughs> when you first move to an area. I honestly would recommend a hotel. Like check out the area first, especially if you're like a woman and you're traveling alone to a new area. It's you, a safety consideration. It's There's safety. something nice about having a front desk who sees you come and go. Like someone isn't going to follow you into a building yeah. and cause you harm. Not to be scary or like an old mom, but. But you want to be safe, especially because as a travel nurse or as a grad, grad student on an away rotation or as a CRNA on an away rotation, Safety is not something you really want to be worried about. You want to just take out all of the kind of concerning factors so that you can focus on your work or focus on being a student so that you can just dedicate all of your brain energy there. Now, every single time I move to a new city, I stay in a hotel for the first few days. So I can also check out the parking. I can check out what the commute is going to be like. I can check out 
what areas are going to be somewhere that I'd enjoy hanging out? Like, do they have a lot of places for workout classes? Do they have a place that has a food court? Is there somewhere that I might want to move in the next couple of days? That's going to be a really good fit for my assignment or for the period of time that I'm there. And you can only do so much on Google Maps panning out an area. So when you move into a hotel for a few days, you also have a more generous refund policy than you do when booking with like Airbnb or something like that. And it gives you time to feel out the area before you pay thousands of dollars out of pocket for lodging that may or may not work out. Something a lot of people don't realize about hotels too is that you can actually stay in hotel suites that are apartment-like. So most major hotel chains have different subcategories of suite chains. Like, I wish I could think of the names of them, but like, so for example, the Hilton chain and the Marriott chain, they have their own like chain of hotels within that subcategory that have all apartment style hotels. And it might even be something to consider doing for like an entire duration of a contract because you can accrue points with that system if you're going to be doing this regularly, especially if your stipend is generous and it's going to cover it anyway. Um, Or even again, if you just do it for a few days, you can start slowly accumulating points. You have the full refund policy. If something falls through, let's say your travel assignment gets canceled at the last minute, you have the safety factor, just that peace of mind factor of making it easy. There's also something really nice about somebody just cleaning your room every day. That's huge. It's so nice. Like, especially if you were an RRNA on like your cardiac rotation, you're away in a different city, you're tired, stressed, and exhausted, and then you come home from clinical to a clean bed every day. There's something nice about that. Washed sheets, fresh towels, a vacuum floor. That stuff is huge after a 12 or a 13 hour day where you don't have to worry about the cleaning. I... I can't recommend that aspect enough. And I think a lot in nursing school, we don't really learn a whole lot about like financial literacy. One of the resources I really like are the points guy and nerd wallet for reading about credit card points, right? So if you have your travel nursing stipend or your locums anesthesia um, stipend that is specifically to be used for housing, there's no reason to not double up on points so that you can then also use those points for more flights or more hotel booking points in the at the end of the day. So Nerd Wallet and the Points Guy, most of the you can do a lot of reading about which travel partners partner with what. You can you usually end up with like a Chase Visa and like an Amex something in there. And then you can use that for Delta flights. And then also for like Marriott Bonvoy and all of these other things are good resources to be utilizing. So that you can then, you know, in between assignments, sometimes even take a vacation on the points that you used up booking your assignments for the entire time. That's just another kind of tool to consider. And then we'll have that kind of linked in the description so you can go read about it. One thing I will say is don't be tricked by using points at the expense of spending hundreds of dollars more than you would otherwise, right? So if there's (laughs) like use just because you're getting points doesn't mean that you need to spend more money. But do a cost comparison between the different places that you might want to live. I would say at least live in a hotel for a few days and then consider your options. Yeah, then look at Airbnb, Furnish Finder, Hello Landing. Um, You can also, of course, look at just short-term apartment rentals in the area if it's a city that has that options like if it's a city people vacation routinely Mm -hmm. sometimes you could just find straight up short-term rentals or even through word of mouth Um, sometimes there's a nurse on the unit who is renting out their place or somebody knows someone but starting out in a hotel is going to just take out that layer of stress and allow you to potentially accumulate points for future hotel stays and for people who are in anesthesia school i would recommend joining travel nurse housing facebook groups That can be a good resource for you to find housing. I will also say this. Housing is not something as a traveler, I think it's the best to try to kind of skimp on. I would say, again, like the peace of mind of having a place that's cleaned pretty frequently, like for you and potentially having your own space, especially if you already have a living stipend. I think that's one thing that makes the travel nursing experience really kind of seamless and streamlined overall. I did a few times on a few different assignments try to like find places on Craigslist or whatever that were like cheaper. And then what is, oh my gosh, Chrissy, you have a saying about this. Cheap is expensive. Oh my gosh, that is so true. So when you're trying to, and that's what I found out with my first assignment, right? I was trying to save money by going in with somebody that I didn't know very well. And I tried to skimp out on like a kind of cheapish Airbnb. It ended up costing me four grand at the end of the day because I was trying to save a couple hundred dollars. So 
if you are in a position where you know you're going to be getting like a travel nursing stipend, make sure you're like staying in an area where you're going to feel comfortable and do your research on the area. But then maybe just like, you know, every time you try to like cut corners and find stuff that's like kind of cheap, you're running like more risk of actually spending more money in the long run. Addition to that. <laughs> so living stipend aside, this is something I didn't know until Anna taught me more about it. It is important, like as a travel nurse, especially, and the same thing applies if you're going to do CRNA locums and anytime you're receiving a housing stipend, mm -hmm. this is quote unquote tax free money. That only works if you're actually duplicating expenses. Oh, my gosh. So you have to make sure you're duplicating expenses. You have to actually have two domiciles, right? You have to have your home address where you're paying some sort of rent to, not your parents' house, unless you're actually going to pay them a real rent and be able to demonstrate that to the IRS. Not $50 a month. And it can't be $50 a month. It has to be, like, market rate. And then you also have to actually duplicate a living expense. So... You know, I have a friend who's taking a contract right now in Brooklyn. He's getting $6,000 a month in a housing stipend, and he's spending about $4,000 a month on his housing. He is truly duplicating expenses, um, and that's on his current rent. And then he pays, like, um, I think $2,000 a He was able to duplicate his expenses because of the number of months per year that he had a duplicate expense in Philadelphia. So it worked out for tax purposes. But um Next year, he's not going to be able to receive that stipend because he won't be duplicating expenses anymore. But the point of that is you have to actually duplicate expenses. Anna has a whole video on this called The 50 Mile Rule Does Not Exist. Go watch this video. This is such a common myth in the travel nursing community. So you have to spend the money anyway. The money is being given to you by cheaping out and trying to, like, save those couple hundred dollars. Don't be penny wise and pound foolish. Mm -hmm. Invest in yourself. Take out the stress. Navigating a travel nursing assignment or like moving to a new city or just taking on new learning challenges is stressful enough. Make sure you're doing things that are safe and streamlined. And again, you'll often come out with a cost savings or at least a net wash than if you did it the harder way on the back end. And I think a lot of people are going to have questions about this tax-free stipend. Do go check out that video. I dig into kind of the nitty gritty of what is involved with that. And this is something that you will find on the travel nursing like Facebook groups is widely misunderstood, like wildly misunderstood. So to make sure that you're just doing everything by the book, work with a tax professional always, make sure that you're following like the letter of the law. And then I would say, do, <laughs> do your own research, but also work with a tax professional, right? So just make sure that you're hitting all those boxes and check out that video for a little bit more. Speaking of moving to a new city, that brings us into kind of topic number two, which is how do you move so often and how do you do that effectively? Oh my God. Moving is so stressful and so chaotic and it's so easy to lose time in the mm. moving process and lose money essentially if it's delaying the start of your contract, right? So it's... <laughs> back to cheap is expensive. It comes right back to that. Cheap is expensive. I mean, if you can hire movers, hire movers. That is one thing that I found has saved me so much time in the end. So... In relation to that, I mentioned how my first contract, I was moving from Baltimore to California, right? Yeah, that's probably too far of a move to hire movers. So that is a long move. However, I encourage people who are moving for work to calculate the number of days that you're losing to move your stuff mm. versus just renting, using, or buying when you get to the new location. So as a travel nurse, when I was working, I was making between like base 80 and 175 dollars an hour if i was to drive myself from baltimore to california for that base rate of 175 dollars an hour i would lose like three or four days driving if i do two of those days working it's a couple thousand dollars it becomes worth it immediately to ship my car for a thousand dollars so Try to look at your move in terms of opportunity cost of what you're losing by doing stuff yourself by not working. Specifically in relation to should I rent a car? Should I ship my car? Should I fly? Should I drive? Should I hire movers? Right? Yeah. So like look at your time as valuable, especially if you're moving for like an anesthesia job or a travel nursing job. That's another cost savings to also consider. Um, I think a lot of people are afraid to live in expensive cities on the East Coast specifically. Mm -hmm forgetting that they have really good public transportation and they're walkable and you might not need a car at all. That's huge. That's a huge cost savings. So when I graduate CRNA school in 2025, 
I will be hireable at employers, <laughs> particularly in New York City. I'm looking at potentially working in New York when I graduate. I have, at this moment, a car that has 237,000 miles on it. We're going to see if she can get through grad school. If she gets through grad school, I'm actually not going to buy another car because I would move straight to New York. And then I don't need a car. You don't need a car. And that's a huge cost saving. So if you're a travel nurse and you're going to L.A. where you have to have a car and you're renting a car, you're spending like 800 to 1000 ish a month on that rental car. Or you're shipping a couple grand to ship your car out plus gas and maintenance and insurance and all of this stuff. You actually pocket a lot by living in either like D.C. or Boston or New York or Philly even. Yeah, you don't need you don't a car have... in any of those cities. Yeah, that, that's a huge cost-saving thing that I think a lot of people overlook a lot of times. Yeah, again, that whole idea of being penny-wise and pound-foolish, make sure you're always calculating in the opportunity costs or the trade-offs. So, yeah, your rent's a little more, but your car payment just cancels it out. Or, yeah, it's more expensive to fly across the country than drive, but you can work a week sooner. So all of those things are really all about just doing the math yourself. Well, and I think we also kind of underestimate how many people have like a $500 car payment a month, right? Oh my so, God, yeah. Like, uh, I think a large amount of people have a pretty expensive car payment and then gas and then insurance on top of that. So, if it costs you like $600, $700 a month to have your car and then you move to New York and then you're taking public transportation and then you spend $600 more on rent, you're like, okay, well, you're actually net even right now and you're moving for an opportunity. So, you shouldn't discount that, you know? Absolutely. And also circling back to the idea of just investing in yourself, like Mm -hmm. going to a place that you're going to enjoy, uh, feel safe in, or just have like a good time in, right? One of the benefits to travel nursing and locums contracts is seeing the country and getting to go different places. And you shouldn't undervalue that because you get sucked up in chasing dollar signs. I completely agree. That actually circles back to another episode we have or another it might be on my YouTube channel about why you shouldn't take the highest paying contract. Oh, that's on her channel. <laughs> uh, usually, if the contract is the highest paying, it's the highest paying for a reason, which means uh, you're going to be making some sacrifices to make that money. So if you're, in my opinion, the biggest perk of travel nursing are the experiences that you can have along the way and networking with other nurses and enjoying different parts of this beautiful country. So... I mean, there can also be the financial freedom piece where you want to take the highest paying contract and then you don't care about where you're living and then you're just there to make money. So it's just choosing what's most important to you and then kind of going from there. Well, and also some people do take those extremely high paying contracts and then take a few months off. And that's an option too. So just again, always calculating in opportunity costs and what it's going to cost you for peace of mind, sleep, (laughs) all of those things. They all add up over time. Which then circles back to if you are moving frequently, whether you are an RRNA who's moving every four months for clinical sites, that might be me next year in 2024, or if you are a travel nurse who's moving every 13 weeks for work, or you're doing locums anesthesia contracts and you're moving every four or five months or so, these are my top moving tips to kind of like save you time as you are like moving frequently. Yeah, you're like a master of moving. So for those of you who have not followed on Anna's social media journey, she also lived in a van at one point. So she has every moving tip down. I mean, my moving tips are like put label every box, (laughs) label what's in every box on the box. So don't just say kitchen or living room, write every item that's in the box on the box. But then and use the, the square boxes that are all the same size and shape. And hire movers. That's it. That's all I got. I mean, those are great tips. But Anna has mastered it. <laughs> so I've been kind of moving every... So 2019, I graduated. And then I lived for one year in Baltimore. So I graduated from Denver. Denver to Baltimore for one year. Baltimore to California times two in 2021. Baltimore to living in a van in California to Denver to Seattle to Oregon to Utah. So I (laughs) moved around a lot in the last couple of years. And I think all of these tips are going to center from a starting point of you have too much stuff, get rid of some of your stuff. Get rid of it. If you want to be a traveler, you really need to downsize significantly. And I know Marie Kondo actually now has kind of taken a step back now that she has kids about her approach to purging things. Has she really? Yeah. She's like, now I have kids and I kind of realized that like, I was a bit, like, intense about it before, but, like, her whole thing before was, like, hold it, and if it gives you joy, keep it, and if it doesn't, 
find it a new home. So like throw it away or donate it or something like that. I still agree with that. I still agree with it as well. I also like, don't have kids. <laughs> We don't have kids, but I think it also is very true, right? So, like, you right now sitting at home probably have some clothes from high school that you don't wear anymore, or you've worn too much and you need to get rid of. So, starting one room at a time to downsize, I think, is really big. I think a lot of nurses have, like, some ADD tendencies. So, you start to purge, and then you go from your, you're bouncing around like a ping pong ball, going from your kitchen to your living room to your dining room, and then you never get anything done. You end up overwhelmed. Set yourself up for a task that you are going to downsize over a few weeks before you start travel nursing and start just getting rid of stuff. I had a summer long purge before I moved to New York City. I went room by room and whenever I had like just downtime, I would just tackle like a closet, a Mm -hmm. drawer, a corner, and I just was constantly donating and getting rid of stuff. It took me three months, but yeah, planning ahead is a great way to do that and just take it one project at a time. And you're going sequentially, right? So you're going through like rooms of your house because like, Maybe you're dining where you want to donate to somebody who lives close to you. You want to give it to somebody. Or, like, maybe your Christmas decorations you actually don't need to keep anymore, right? So then it, all of that stuff, it can take three months. But I will say before you start traveling, it's in your best interest to do a huge purge. From there, starting from your closet, I will say this. You really want to be able – your goal is to be able to fit all of your belongings in one car. So if you can fit all your stuff in an SUV – you are good to go from a travel nursing standpoint. I will say it did take me about six months of traveling to get my stuff whittled down to that lean of a situation. And you might have to use a storage unit along the way to help get you there. That's okay. But the leaner you can get from the time that you start, the easier of a time you're going to have moving from point A to point B. As far as actually packing that stuff up, I will say this. You want to be able to fit everything in those plastic bins not cardboard boxes. Cardboard boxes are going to be like, they're going to disintegrate if you're moving around a lot. Yeah. When I lived in a van for 10 months, we moved like four times and the cardboard boxes that I had started to like disintegrate. Yeah. They're good moves. for like one move. Like yeah. <laughs> if you're moving for life, like when I moved from Philadelphia to New York, for that purpose, I actually love the Home Depot or Lowe's moving kits that they're are like the cardboard duty, boxes. Yeah. They're heavy-duty cardboard. They're not just, like, cardboard boxes that you've found that are all going to be different shapes and sizes, right? They're, like, perfect cubes, and they come in three sizes, and you put the heaviest stuff in the smallest, medium-weight stuff in the medium, and lightweight stuff in the big, and you label everything, and you recycle the cardboard when it's done. That is a great way to keep everything organized and stacked into a moving truck. But if you're going to be bopping from place to place every 13 weeks you're going to have to use it over and over and over again. And it's going to have to take a bigger beating and be even more whittled down. So that's when like rubber ray bins with a lid, you're going to use that as storage in the new places too. So it's going to be a lifesaver. The rubber made bins, huge fan. This is exactly what I do now. I have, I think six bins that I can fit into my car. And as I start moving for clinical, all of my stuff is going to fit inside of that. I challenge you. Oh, sorry. No, no, I was going to say, I love um, just plastic bins for health and beauty aids, too, even in a regular move. Yes. Because then it won't leak. Like, if it bounces or explodes in an airplane or something, it's not going to leak all of your stuff. So, I actually have adopted this as, like, my everyday go-to. This is how I store all of my, like, beauty products and, like, hair stuff. It just lives in the bins in my sink, underneath my sink. Oh, yeah. Like, because I don't have all of my toiletries out on display on the sink, I have two bins that are for hair slash miscellaneous and one bin that is for like beauty products and makeup. And then none of it spills, none of it leaks. It all clips up together. They actually stack sequentially on top of each other. And it is like my new place is so clean all the time because all of my stuff is contained inside of these bins. The bins that I use for my clothing and for my shoes, like I said, I think I have like six bins total. And when I'm not actively moving, Four of them stay on top of my washer dryer, and then two of them I use for storage of video equipment and shoes, and that's just how I store my stuff as, like, at baseline. That is so good. You're also going to need less stuff with you if you're moving into places that are either furnished finders, they already have all the pots and pans and most of the stuff you need, Hello Landing, it's the same concept, Mm -hmm. already furnished, already has all the stuff you need. Or again, back to those like hotel suite type things. They have all the things you need. So instead of starting fresh every time, like at a Craigslist type of rental or, you know, a short term 
apartment or even some Airbnbs, they might have more or less stuff than others. Going into a place that you know is going to have all the equipments and supplies is going to reduce the amount of stuff you have to bring. The kitchen stuff is so bulky. And if you're choosing the travel life, I honestly challenge you to like get rid of all of your kitchen stuff except for your spices and like your vitamins and stuff like that. So if you're a travel nurse, unless you're like a chef on the side, do you really need to bring your Vitamix and KitchenAid with you to every single assignment? I don't think you do. I think you can go with just like the tiny little Nutribullet that they have there at the like at the furnished place. And then you're only really bringing your spices with you from like place to place. I don't keep, I, I'm currently still living, I'm in CRNA school. I'm living in a furnished apartment right now. And I don't have any of my own glassware, silverware, cutting boards, none of that stuff. I don't carry any of it with me because I'm going to be moving from furnished place to furnished place until I finish CRNA school. And that is huge as far as like not having to hold on to bedding and like, you know, couches. And then again, if you're moving coast to coast, and you've got a two thousand dollar couch. You got to do the cost benefit analysis of whether it's worth it to spend to spend a thousand dollars to bring that couch from point A to point B, or whether it's worth it to spend three hundred dollars a month storing that couch for the next six months. Because you might end up finding yourself in a place where you lived on the east coast, but now you live permanently on the west coast, and you're paying a couple hundred dollars a month to store a couch back east. Get rid of it to start, and then build your life wherever you end up finding yourself. A really good opportunity <laughs> for getting rid of stuff here is the buy nothing Facebook groups. Oh, that's huge. Because when you get rid of stuff, people will come and like pick it up from your place. So mm -hmm. you, you don't even have to drive it down to Goodwill yourself. And when you end up in your new location, you can also find new things you need for free, which is nice, especially if you're a grad student, by getting something from the buy nothing Facebook group in that area as well. So it's a it's a give and take. It's going to benefit you as the giver. It's going to benefit you as the receiver. And the people in those groups are generally extremely nice and extremely helpful. That's so huge. And then you can end up in a place where you don't have to bug people to use their truck because you're getting rid of your like large furniture. And then that, le that leaves you so much freer to like move around the country. Which, when you're moving around the country, I think some of the most important things to choose are whether you're going to be choosing a contract somewhere for location-based experiences or usually compensation, right? So I think you really need to choose what your priority is before going into those contracts. And then when it comes to choosing contracts, especially on the travel nursing side, I think it's important that you are aware of all of the different options and all the different contracts available on the market which is why we're really excited to partner with the sponsor of today's episode, Fusion Marketplace. A mistake I made as a new travel nurse was just going off of the word of mouth recommendation of somebody from the unit. So I was not empowered, nor was I really educated to make the best choice about which contracts were available on the market because I was only looking at one agency. So when you work with Fusion Marketplace, they have over 20 different travel nursing agencies that are listed on their free platform you're going to be choosing between thousands of different travel nursing jobs. This is really going to make sure that you are making the best choice for you, dependent on whether you're looking for something in a given location or whether you're looking for a certain price point for your travel nursing package. Or if you're a traveler who's interested in CRNA school, making sure that you stay in high acuity specialties. That is so huge and such an underrated tip because you can be a travel nurse and be preparing for CRNA school, but you need to be working at specific high acuity locations. As a person who's contacted by recruiters constantly, I really like that Fusion Marketplace respects your privacy. They don't share your contact information with recruiters unless you express interest in a job, right? So that's something we definitely want to do is we want to talk to recruiters. We want to know about the jobs, but maybe we don't need to know about every job. So I think Fusion does a really good job with that as well. If you're a current traveler, you know how big of a deal that is. And we really like working with Fusion Marketplace in part just because they respect you as a traveler and they respect your time and we respect theirs. When it comes to those dream contracts in the best locations or at these high acuity units, if you don't move quickly, you can miss out on those contracts. So make sure that you create your traveler profile. When you create and have a completed traveler profile, you have an increased likelihood of getting that dream job placement quickly. Fusion Marketplace has over 20,000 jobs currently available. Head to the link in the description below to make sure that you're getting the most competitive jobs on the market today. Another place that people tend to lose money is in delayed contracts because they're not keeping things organized. So we just mentioned Fusion Marketplace to you guys about having the traveler profile and being able to jump on new jobs quickly. But 
make sure that you're actually ready to jump into that contract by keeping everything organized. This is Anna's key takeaway, something that she scolds me about all the time. Anna, how do we make sure we keep everything organized? You need to have an organized Google Drive that has all of your credentialing information ready to go at all times. <laughs> an organized Google Drive. Guys, we have an entire YouTube video on this. <laughs> I think actually I made it a whole like lecture. I think I made like a whole PowerPoint about why you need a Google Drive. But this is going to be something, whether you are a CRNA who is moving jobs, whether you are doing locals anesthesia, whether you are a travel nurse, whether you're a graduating nursing student, everybody needs a Google Drive with all their credentialing stuff in there constantly because you don't want to miss out on opportunities and you don't want to miss out on onboarding at your dream job way faster, right? So one example, currently I'm an RNA, I'm a second year and our farm professor is super cool. She's our first woman professor. Love that. So I immediately was like, Hey, can I shadow you? I sent her an email and now I realize that they need all of my immunization information, a background, a background check, and also a drug screen. I already have all of that in my Google Drive. You know right, how long yeah. <laughs> it And I would have had another maybe like two, three week delay. And then that would have cost me educational opportunities. But because I have it all ready to go, it's locked and loaded. And then I can like say yes to whatever opportunities come my way. As a travel nurse, this is huge, especially when you're working with different agencies to have everything organized within the Google Drive. You've got your ACLS, you've got your PA, you've got your PALS, you've got your BLS, you've got your immunizations, you've got your letters of recommendation. Huge pro tip. Every single contract that you go to when you start meeting charge nurses who you vibe with, get their contact info, add it to a Google Doc, have it in your Google Drive. That way, you never have to be scrambling for who your three references are for your new contracts. Keep a running list of, con of contacts for your letters of recommendation for grad school purposes, for travel nursing purposes, for networking purposes. I just went to a professional anesthesia conference and I made a Google Doc of some of the people that I've met and their contact information and where they work. Because again, this is something that's gonna help you out so much later. I can't overemphasize enough. Watch this YouTube video about the Google Drive. <laughs> because it really circles back to, you don't wanna have opportunities pass you by because you are unorganized and disorganized. You know? Amen. Amen. What's my favorite phrase regarding this? Uh, Jara says it all the time. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready? No, I love that. Oh. <laughs> no, that's great. That's so that cute. That might be our friend Ryan from TikTok. She says that? That's a good one. Well, Jara always says, um, by failing to plan, you can plan to fail. So true. That's really what this is, right? Like, have systems in place. Oh, my God. Our OBM, our online business manager, Anna. Hey, Anna. We love hey, you. Anna, we love hey. you. Hey. She is always talking about like systems, develop a system, like start with that. And you and I tend to be go-getters and tend to get so far ahead of ourselves with projects and ideas sometimes that we don't slow down and create the system. Don't be me. <laughs> slow down and create the moving system. Plan ahead by, you know, do your purge, do the math buy bins, <laughs> get a Google Drive. All of these things are going to help make you just more efficient and save you time, energy, stress, and money. And I think people don't realize how fast travel nursing moves either. So from the time that you create a traveler profile and you start talking to a recruiter, you might be starting your first contract like 10 days later. That's not a lot of time. So if you are starting from the back end disorganized and you don't know where any of your certifications are, you're going to be pulling your hairs out and you're going to be stressed out starting your first travel nursing contract. And that, and that's not the empowering, freeing experience that I want for y'all to have. I want for y'all to have a, this is easy. This is so exciting. This is something that I've been looking forward to for a long time. And when you can have that experience, if you just set yourself up for success on the back end. Definitely. And keep in mind, the reason why things move at this pace is because these are needs that need to be filled now. They're needs that yeah need to be filled yesterday, typically. So you don't want to sit on it and miss opportunities because you're disorganized. So, And a tip for the RRNAs out there, I am one who's going to have clinical rotations in multiple states. Many of y'all might have that same situation as well. Pro tip and check out our nurse licensing episode. We have that as well. Your CRNA certification slash credentialing tax on, it's like an add-on to your nursing license. So if you are doing a clinical rotation in CRNA school, or you want to do a clinical rotation in a certain state, 
make sure that you are licensed to practice in that state. This is going to speed up your credentialing process as an RRNA. It can also help speed up your credentialing once you pass your NCE and you're trying to onboard a new state. Specifically, the state that I'm thinking about is if I am in school in Arizona, let's say, and I want to be a CRNA in either New York or in California when I graduate, if I wait until I graduate and pass my boards to apply for my California nursing license, it might take literally seven months for me to start working as a CRNA in California. Oh, at minimum, because you would need your nursing license first, then you would need your advanced practice nursing license, and then your DEA license. And typically, you can't just do those all at the same time. You'll need no. your nursing license before you apply for the APRN in most cases. So California is famous for taking up to six months for just your nursing license to come through. Could you imagine being a new grad CRNA, and now you're run out of cost of living loans? and Because that last disbursement is... Usually in January, if you're a May graduate. The beginning of your last semester, whatever that may be. So you now have no income. I guess you'll go back to bedside nursing if you're that desperate. Wouldn't that stink? I know a few people who did that because they're waiting to credential for so long, which is usually not what you want to do when you just finish grad school. So that being said, if you know you are interested in potentially working in a state that is not a part of the nurse licensure compact, or even if you have a compact license, you need to know that you need to have a license in the individual state if you want to work there as a CRNA. Go ahead and apply, especially, pro tip, if you're a travel nurse who's looking at CRNA school, consider looking to see if agencies will comp you for the cost of licensing. That's part of how I got California, Oregon, Washington, D.C., New York, and Hawaii, and a compact license. And I have ended up not paying out of pocket, I believe, for... I think I only paid out of pocket for New York and Hawaii because I wasn't I was no longer traveling at that time. So that's something that you can look into as well. Anyway, if you do not, what is that saying? If you fail to plan, you could plan to fail. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And subscribe to this podcast and tell us what you want <laughs> us to talk about next time. We are really excited about this next episode. Your first day in the operating room. Join us for that. See you See later. You there. <laughs>